Good morning, Maranatha family. It is great to have you with us this morning. I'm Pastor David, the community life pastor here at Maranatha, and we're thankful that you're joining us for worship, whether that's in our worship center or on our live stream. We're thankful that we can worship together today. If you are a guest, we're especially thankful that you have joined us, and we'd love to have an opportunity to connect with you, answer any questions you might have, or know how we can be praying for you. That can happen a couple of ways. If you're here, you can stop by the Welcome Center and pick up a Connect card and fill that out, or you can text the word guest to the number on the screen, and it'll start an automated process, again, just to gather your contact information so someone can follow up with you. But we're glad you're here. A few announcements as we get started this morning. Uh, first, um, next Sunday evening, next Sunday evening, we'll be having a Christmas family gathering, and our teens will be leading the time of worship. We hope You'll plan to come and be a part of that. All of the details are in the Maranatha Minute, but it's next Sunday evening at 6. We hope you'll be here for that. Also, uh, the annual business meeting, which will be a week from this coming Wednesday. Uh, hopefully, you've picked up your annual meeting packet for that as well. It's at both of the entryways as well as under the TV in the lobby, but pick one of those up and look through that and be praying about our annual meeting. We hope you'll be here for that as well. Um, with those two things said, would you join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Father, we gather this morning rejoicing in your goodness, in your sovereign care, in the love that you have shown us. And even at a time of year that tends to be increasingly busy, Lord, with the chaotic and hectic lives that we tend to live anyways, and with the challenges and struggles that we're all facing Lord, it's good that we can gather this morning knowing that you are God, knowing that you are good, knowing that as we worship you and exalt you, that our hearts are brought closer to you. So, Father, we pray even this morning that you would inhabit the praise of your people, that you would help us to be very aware of all that Christ has done on our behalf and Father, just the promise that since you did not withhold your only Son, that we know with him you freely give us all good things. Father, we pray that as we come under the preaching of your word, that you would empower Pastor Andrew, that you would guide and direct him. But Father, help us to be receptive, that we would receive the truth, that we would be nourished and challenged, encouraged, that our love for you would grow. Father, we also pray that you would help us this morning take the time to love and care for one another. Help us to be aware of those around us that might need additional encouragement, need someone to come alongside and pray with them and, and love on them. Father, help us to be sensitive of how we can be a part of ministering to and caring for the body of Christ. Lord, we also pray for the opportunities as we leave from this place to go out as, as an army carrying the truth of the gospel with us, that we might be able to proclaim Christ's excellencies in all that we say and all that we do, that we would see more and more people come to know his love, even as we have. Father, we just thank you again that we can gather today and that we can enjoy the, the freedom to worship you. And Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters around the world that, that are living in more diff difficult and challenging situations where they're facing persecution and suffering. And Father, we pray for an abundance of grace on them. Help us to be sensitive. Help us to be faithful in prayer. And Father, help us to be thankful for all that you are doing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning, Maranatha. Would you stand together? We are here this morning to celebrate the joy that we have in Christ. Pastor Andrew will be preaching from Psalm 21. And I'd like us to begin by reading together a portion of Psalm 21, and just to kind of set the stage for that. What are the attributes, as we read this, what are the attributes and the works that King David calls attention to in our God? Let's read this together. O oh Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, and in your salvation how greatly he exalts. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. For you meet him with rich blessings. 
you set a crown of fine gold upon his head. He asked life of you. You gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you bestow on him. For you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord now and always. Sing it again, we rejoice. Delight in the love He has shown us. Gratefully lift up your voice. His gentleness among us will join our hearts with praise. We gather in His goodness. A family of grace with each breath he's given. Praise the Lord in these times we live in. We will praise the Lord throughout every season. I am sure we have it. for nothing praying for all that you need come with a song of thanksgiving lay your requests at his feet his peace is all upon us to guide our hearts and minds in Christ who reigns eternal the shepherd of our Sing together. 
This next song we're going to sing together will be new uh, to many of you. Christmas is a difficult time for music because we love to sing the traditional things, in which we will over the next few weeks, but there's also a plethora of new music being written each year. And so over the next few weeks, uh, I, I would like to sing a new song together each week with the hope of on December 24th, Christmas Eve, we gather together and we know all of them. We're going to sing them all together, uh, all of these songs that we're going to learn uh, the next three weeks. But uh, our focus is not on the songs that we sing. Our focus is on our Lord. So picture Christ, the eternal God, sent by God the Father to this earth, the Word of God made flesh. John 1 right? John, um, John the Baptist talks about not being that light, but he came to bear witness of the light. 
which exposes the darkness of our world and our, our goal and our desire is that God would, would spread his light all over this earth and that everyone that we know would come to know the truth of the knowledge of God. But he did that through Christ, laying down his life, becoming one of us, laying aside the glories of heaven to become a man, to be tempted in every way as we are, to lay down his life as a sinner's death on a cross, the death that we deserve, the wrath of God poured out on him so that we could know him. And then the Spirit of God used the Word of God to turn on the light of our souls and to help us see that we are sinners and that we have a need of a Savior. And he, by the power of the gospel in his word, drew us to salvation. That is worth joy. Let's sing this together. Know it, sing along. Light of the world, treasure of heaven, brilliant like the stars in the wintry sky. Joy of the Father, reach through the darkness, shine across the Send the shadows to fly. That's the melody. Let's sing it together. Light of the world, from the beginning, the tragedies of time were no match for your love. From great heights of glory, you saw my story. God, you entered in and became one of us. And we respond with hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah for the things he has done. Come and adore him.
God, we thank you for the things that you've done. We thank you for what this season means to us as believers. And I just pray as we listen to your word preached today and as we focus our mind on the meaning of Christmas and um, just that how you sent your son to come to this earth and everything that that means to us, Lord, I just pray you would tune our hearts to what you would have us learn this season, God. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Please be seated. We're entering the Christmas season, and um, I find for myself, hopefully this isn't true for you, but I, I find for myself the older I get, the harder it is to find joy, like during the season. The, the difficulties and distractions and all of the, the things that are going on, the, the struggles of planning and making sure that everyone is getting the right gifts and so on, all, all of the... The, the scheduling and frustrations that happen with crowds and traffic, it, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to remember joy. You know, it wasn't so difficult as a kid. You know, Christmas was kind of a magical time as a kid. You, you guys still finding kind of a magical? Like, I can't wait for Christmas, all of the, the great food, the good gifts, the time with, with our family and friends, our cousins that are coming, whatever it is that... Christmas for kids tends to be a lot more magical than it tends to be for adults. Well, what is it going to take for us as believers to embrace joy when things are in a hurry? To, to embrace joy in, in times of, of Christmas and to carry it through, really, for the, for the whole year. Does, does God really care about our joy? Well, we're going to spend some time in these next several weeks as we're doing Advent, to, to go back to the Psalms and to see these, these Psalms that point forward to Christ and, and what we can enjoy because of Christ as it relates to Christmas, but also as it relates to the Christian life. Um, as I think about the Psalm that we're going to be talking about today in Psalm 21, you can find it for yourself in the Pew Bible on page 457, I would encourage you to turn there, Psalm 21. In this psalm, we're going to see that the strength of the Lord is your joy. The strength of the Lord is your joy. And of course, those of you who've been around for a while and have sung songs also know that joy of the Lord is our strength. That's what Nehemiah says in chapter 8. And so if the strength of the Lord is our joy... And the joy of the Lord is our strength. You, you find that the, it's just this, this cyclical kind of inspiring kind of revolution that happens as we come to look at and in, enjoy the strength of God. It leads to joy, which strengthens us, and we find our strength in him that continues to amplify joy in us. Well, to remind ourselves of the strength of God, I, I wonder if there's a song that you, we all remember. You, you all know the song, My God is So Big? You know that song? Okay. I'm going to invite anybody, all the kids that know My God is So Big, can help me with the hand motions, help, help these adults with these hand motions as we sing this together. All the brave kids that know My God is So Big, can you come up and help the big kids? All right, good. Come on up, guys. All right, fantastic. It's spread out, okay, all the, all the way over to the side here. There we go. Fantastic. <clears throat> all right. Well, to do this right, I've got to put my, my iPad down. You can just stand right there. Okay, ready? Here we go. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. We're all doing the hand motions. Ready? My God is so big. So strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Some of you are reluctant, come on. The mountains are his, the valleys are his, the stars are his handiwork too. Much better, good job. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Fantastic, thank you guys. <clears throat> 
Way to go, way to go. Isn't it interesting that the foundations that we lay or that are laid for us as children to look at the strength of God, to remember how mighty God is, are those foundations that, that really should help to carry us as adults, to help lead us to the kinds of things we should know because they're so simple, they're so foundational, they should be so easy for us to, to grasp. We just need to lay hold of those same truths so we can begin to cultivate the, the things that we desire, the things that God wants for us as it relates, especially this morning, to joy. Of course, there are even those verses that we all remember or memorized when we were kids. I, Isaiah 41.10, you, you all know this. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The power of God. We don't have to fear. We don't have to be anxious. We can, we can trust him. And as our dependence is on him, he can carry us. And of course, one of my favorites, Joshua 1.9, where, where God is coming to this leader, Joshua. He says, have not I commanded you. Be strong and have a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua the strength that you have is not a strength of your own. You can be strong. You can be courageous. You don't have to be afraid because God is with you wherever you go. Trust him. Colossians 1, 15 to 17, Paul puts it this way. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. God is unstoppable. His force is indisputable. He is supreme. Trust in his power. His strength will carry you and lead you to joy. That's the message today. The Bible con consistently points to the God of, of, of all creation, who helps us understand that he is mighty and full of power. Not just in the New Testament, but the Old Testament, we find that this message of who God is and his strength is just carrying through from start to finish. So as we turn our attention to Psalm 21 today, as we look at verse 1, we see that this is what the psalmist wants to focus his attention on and he wants to draw others in to see it too. So notice with me, Psalm 21, verse 1 says this. O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices. And in your salvation, how greatly he exults. In verse 13, it says, Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. As we come to this Advent season, which is the really just means coming or arrival, we are looking and, and remembering what the, what the people of old, the, in the Old Testament in particular, they were looking forward to this first return of Christ, the first coming of Christ. And here we are in a place as God's people looking forward to his second coming, his second advent, as it were. And we come to realize that that there were promises about this future Messiah that we can find throughout the scripture that, that Jesus was the fulfillment of those promises. And, and what was so difficult for those living in the first century is that there was this mixed message as it seemed, this mingling of suffering in glory that they just couldn't wrap their heads around. Peter refers to this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, when he says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, searching what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ in the subsequent glories. How can you wrap your head around this mingling of suffering and glory? And so Jesus was this uh, the, the picture of this Messiah uh, describing this ministry of Christ that was coming. And of course, Jesus himself 
pointed to this fact with his disciples on the day of his, of his resurrection. Remember, there are two disciples who, after the resurrection, were, were, were troubled and confused and a little bit discouraged that they were walking back to their hometown Emmaus, and, and a stranger appears to them along the way. It was Jesus, and they, they couldn't recognize him. Luke 24, 16 says their eyes were kept from recognizing him. They, they had spent the last three years with him. They, they had seen him and, and, and had been acquainted with his ministry. They, they knew this Jesus, and yet for some reason, here he was, and they just could not see him. Jesus says, so how are you guys doing? What, what's going on? And they're like, are you the only person in, in, in Jerusalem that doesn't know the events that have happened today? What's your problem? So they explain all of the confusion behind this empty tomb and, and not really coming to terms with, with the fact that, that Jesus' body wasn't there and, and not knowing what that all meant. So Jesus turns to them and responds in Luke 24, 25. He says this. He says, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them, interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. We find they eventually come to their senses. In, in verse 31, it says, And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from, from their sight. Finally, there's an awareness. This is Jesus. He was with us. What were we thinking? And Jesus opened the scripture to us, and so in their enthusiasm, they turn, they, 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 they rise up, and they head right back to Jerusalem. This, this trip of 20-some miles back to Jerusalem and they come to meet the, uh, the disciples who are there. Actually, I think it was seven miles, sorry. They meet the disciples in the upper room. They're telling them what they had just encountered, Jesus, along the road. And then Jesus, he comes. He's with them. And in verse 44 to 47, we find Jesus speaking to them. He says, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their mind to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. The continuity of scripture from start to finish speaks about this future ministry that Christ would have. And so as we come to the Psalms, we're going to pinpoint some of the Messianic Psalms beginning in Psalm 21, next week moving to Psalm 22, and then Psalm 23, and then Psalm 24, consecutively seeing how from these Messianic Psalms we can see this, this future picture of Jesus Christ. And so as we come to Psalm 21, we, we find that it is the strength of the Lord that will lead to joy. The strength of the Lord that will lead to joy in the hearts of God's people. Look with me again at verse 1. We're going to see, first of all, the, the Lord's strength was the theme of their singing. The theme of their singing. Notice what it says in the subtitle. It says, To the choir master, a psalm of David. Now The subtitles are included in many of the psalms. And they point to the, the context or the purpose for which the psalm was written. Sometimes we, we find the, the intent by which these psalms were intended to accomplish. And the Masoretes who, who would help to preserve the text would include uh, later on something called vowel pointing. Because they, they realized that over the, the, the centuries people were where fewer and fewer people were able to remember how these words should be pronounced. The words in the Hebrew were only the consonants, and so the verbal tradition was the only thing that would help people remember how these words should be pronounced. And so the Masoretes included vowel pointing in the text to help ensure that future generations would know what the words actually were. But the Masoretes also, in order to preserve the text, in the copies that they would make, at the very end of each of the books that they wrote would, would put a total of the words that were within the book. Now imagine trying to compose the total of words in the book of Psalms. 
and counting all those words, but ensuring that all of the words that were intended to be in the text were counted and were, in fact, present. These subtitles were included in that count. And so it's likely to assume that these subtitles are actually a part of, of, of Scripture itself. And, and so we, we find that, that David handed this psalm to the choir master with, with a particular purpose. This was intended to be a song of praise, not just for David himself, but a song of praise that was to be sung by, by the people at large. And upon further study, we come to observe that this Psalm 21 is just a response to a song that was sung in the chapter before in Psalm chapter 20. That these two kind of form a pair. Psalm 20 is this psalm of petition in asking for help. Psalm 21, a song of praise in seeing that God is bringing help, has brought help. Notice with me just... Move back to Psalm 20 for a moment and let me read this through for us so we can begin to see some of the, some of the, the, the similarities between these. Psalm 20 begins, To the choir master, a song or a psalm of David. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings in regard... With favor, your burnt sacrifices, Selah. May he grant your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation. And in the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots. Some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. O oh Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. There are a number of correlations between these two. We can see that it, it kind of forms a, a, a petition and a response, a, a psalm that is, is asking for help and the echo of the help that has been provided that we find in Psalm 21. We see these tandem themes of prayer and praise. That's our first sub-point here. Prayer and praise from Psalm 20, verses 1 and 9. It says, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. O Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. In Psalm 21, verse 1, O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices. In your salvation, how greatly he exalts. Salvation prayed for. Salvation is experienced. Then we also find this heart's desire in both Psalms. In Psalm 20, verse 4, may he grant your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. And then the answer in Psalm 21, verse 2, you have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. We also find joy in salvation. Notice chapter 20, verse 5. May we shout for joy over your salvation. And in chapter 21, verses 5 and 6, His glory is great through your salvation. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. Notice the similarities of trust in the Lord. In Psalm 20, verse 7, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 21, verse 7, For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. And finally, this look, looking and trusting in the right hand of the Lord. In Psalm 20, verse 6, Now I know the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. And then in Psalm 21, verse 8, Your hand... We'll find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find those who hate you. We observe that Psalm 20 is this prayer for help. Psalm 21 is this prayer for praise. It is thought that, that this psalm, these songs were, were used together, one by the company of the congregation of the armies that would go into battle, 
knowing what was coming, praying for God's rescue, for God's salvation, his deliverance. And then Psalm 21 is this response of praise as God would give victory and they would see the hand of the Lord that has covered and protected them and brought salvation to them as a people. Psalm 21 is this praise from the people as they return victorious. So David, in order to draw the most people into participation, in order to make this the most memorable, the most public, to call attention to the Lord and invite the most participation, he turns this into a song. Not just that it would be sung by him, but it would be sung by the nation. And, and as you know, how memorable songs can be, you find yourselves singing or humming these same kinds of songs that go through your mind throughout the week. And, and David has in mind, how do I call attention to the strength of God that leads to joy? And I'm going to turn this into, the so, into a song so that everyone can participate and remember who God is and it can settle their hearts in rejoicing in the Lord. So David hands these two songs over to the choir master, one for prayer and one for praise. He wants them to be remembered. And as David often does, he, he turns trouble into triumph. He invites others to participate with him because those who rely on the strength of the Lord will be led with joy and will do whatever they can to lead others into joy. And praise is perhaps... The greatest window to faith, as we find from John, uh, James chapter 1, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. How can we do that as believers? We can do that only because we trust that God is over our circumstances. God is over our troubles. And so David is inviting the nation to celebrate in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of trouble, to celebrate the triumph of God and the strength of God that leads to joy. Next we find the strength of of the Lord was the reason for their joy. Again, here in verses 1 and verse 13. The grammatical structure of these two verses draws attention to the Lord's strength. They form what is called an inclusio in the Hebrew language, which is essentially just a bracketing system in the grammar that helps you know that, that when one verse is set apart by another verse. It, it, it forms a bracket, and the content in the middle is meant to explain the two thoughts that are on either end. So the beginning and the end are meant to point out the theme, and the content of what is in the middle is meant to explain. So notice in Psalm 21, verse 1, it says this, O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, and in your salvation how greatly he exalts. Then he says in verse 13, Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. Immediately we see several things. We see, first of all, this repeated phrase of, O Lord, in your strength. The strength that's being referred to is the power or the force of God. It's a word that's primarily used in the Hebrew Old Testament to speak of God's power. A power that he possesses, a power that belongs to him, a power that he is able to exercise through people, but it, but it, but it originates from him. This, this primarily is a word that's related to God's strength, and it's essential, an essential attribute of who God is. It's used of his voice, his arm, a symbol of his power, observable as power in the skies. God exercises this strength on behalf of his people. It belongs to him. And we see in the second half of this psalm, we see that God's hand is at work. Notice in verse 8 to 12. Notice what it says. It says, your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. Verse 9, you will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and fire will consume them. Verse 10, you will destroy their descendants from the earth and their offspring from among the children. Verse 12, for you will put them to flight. You will aim at their faces with your bows. Your strength will accomplish all of this. We can trust you. You bring salvation. Your power is un unrivaled. Second, we see this overflow of joy. The strength of God leads to joy in David 
and joy in the people. Notice in verse 1, there are two words that celebrate the work of God. The king rejoices. The king exalts. And then in verse 13, be exalted. We sing. We praise your power. Each of these words in the Hebrew is distinct from one another. All five Hebrew words are, are different from one another and, and, and provide a, a different way in which the people and David will celebrate this work of God. Calling attention to this expressive and exuberant joy of the king and of the people. The strength of the Lord is this common theme of this praise throughout this psalm. And it's because of the Lord's hand they enjoy all of the things that are contained within this psalm. Thus, God's strength leads to joy. And it becomes the reason for joy for all the people. Because when the king celebrates and the king is saved, the people can celebrate and the people are saved. Saved by the power of the Lord. We find this is a consistent pattern in David's life. That joy is infectious. Joy is meant to be contagious. In Psalm 34, verses 1 and 3, David says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Let's recognize who God is. Sing with me. Participate together. Let's exalt the name of the Lord together, not individually. And we come to realize that the background of this psalm, Psalm 34, is perhaps at the darkest time of David's life. The subtitle reads, Of David, when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him out and he left. You remember the story? David's running from King Saul. He's worried about his life. He runs through this little town called Nob, and he finds this priest and asks for bread, and he asks for a weapon, and the weapon that this priest seems to have is this weapon of Goliath that he hands over to David. And David feels like the only way he's going to be safe is he gets out of the nation of Israel, he escapes into the land of Philistia, and he runs straight into the capital city of Philistia, Gath, which happens to be the hometown of Goliath. And there he is, David, carrying Goliath's sword. And do you suppose people will notice? They did. Isn't that David? <laughs> Isn't that Goliath's sword? And so David has this temporary fit of insanity, as it were. He's not thinking clearly. He's running for his life. He's running headlong into danger. And he has to play like a madman in, in terms of scratching on the doors and slobbering all over his beard so that he can escape this certain doom. And God res rescues him, and it becomes a source of David's joy. He sees God's hand over all of it. And he welcomes others to participate in this joy. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. He turns tragedy into triumph. And he invites others to participate with him in joy. We also see from this psalm that the Lord's strength was the catalyst for faith. What God's strength accomplished is sprinkled throughout this entire psalm. We see in verse 1, it brings salvation. Notice, in your salvation, how greatly he rejoices. In verse 2, it brings answered prayer. Notice, you have given him the, his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. Notice verse 3, it brings blessing. You meet him with rich blessings. In verse 4, it brings life. He asks life of you. You gave it to him, length of days, forever and ever. Notice in verse 5, it brings glory. His glory is great through your salvation, splendor, and majesty you bestow on him. In verse 6, it brings God's presence. For you made him most blessed forever. You make him glad with joy of your presence. And all of this renews David's faith. In verse 7 of this psalm, stands at the very center and becomes the crescendo of this psalm. This is the climax. This is why David can rejoice. He looks at the strength of God. He comes to this place of recognizing his dependability. 
and he stakes his claim and trusts the Lord. Notice verse 7. For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. This word for trust is the word to throw one down upon your face, to extend yourself on the ground. And you, you can imagine that the most vulnerable uh, position that you could ever have, where there, you're as defenseless as possible, but this full trust in the Lord of being extended on your face before him, stretched out in full confidence. This is also to trust, to feel safe, to be confident, to be stretched out and thus to have firmness. The Septuagint, interestingly, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew, the, the Septuagint, interestingly, never translates this word for faith or trust as pistuo, which is the Greek word for faith in the New Testament. But it always translates this word as elpidzo, which is the word for hope. The focus, then, is not on this intellectual aspect of faith. But it becomes this emotional reality of feeling safe. Now, we can understand this, I think. How many times in our lives where we know intellectually a truth, we know we can trust the Lord, but, but, but the anxiety that we feel in our, in our life where things are churning and we're wondering how it's really going to turn out and there really isn't this emotional response to the truth that we know. So our emotions haven't caught up with our head. But not so with David. David is feeling the freedom of hope and safety this emotional response of knowing God is in control. I can trust him. And I feel free. I feel unhindered. This hope that fills his heart. He has this hope in the Lord that has settled him. We see in verse 7 that his hope is founded firmly on the covenant-keeping God. This word for Lord, whenever you see in the Hebrew Old Testament... This word for Lord that's all in caps, you know it's speaking of the promise-making, promise-keeping God. The covenant-keeping God. That's who we're talking about here. And so as David recognizes how God has been faithful to his promises to Abraham and to Isaac and David, how he's been true to his promises to him, he knows that God's uh, name and reputation is dependable. He can trust him. And not only knowing who God is, but but coming to embrace this steadfast love, which is always connected to the covenant-keeping, steadfast love, unconditional nature of God's loyal love for his people. You see, when God makes promises, he doesn't make promises like us. When we make promises, we're limited by wisdom. We don't have perfect foresight. We don't know all the factors. Sometimes we think we know what's best for the people we love, but wisdom would say otherwise. We're limited by wisdom. We're, of course, limited by resources and strength. We're limited by the energy that we have, the capacity to perform, the finances to do what we would like. We're limited, of course, by authority and follow-through. There are people that step in and say, well, you promised this, but you can't really do that. We're limited by fluctuating desire. <laughs> How many times do we have the best um, desires to follow through, but when it comes right around to it, we're like, oh, I'm not sure I want to do that anymore. I don't feel like it. You ever feel that way? We're limited by factors that we can't control, outside factors that interfere with our plans. But when God makes promises, he is not limited in any way. He's not limited in wisdom. He has perfect knowledge and perfect foresight. He can make a promise and knows the fickle hearts of those who he's making promises to that will not change his promise-keeping, promise-making ability. He's already seen it happen. He knows it's coming. He has unlimited resources, as you know. He's infinite. He's eternal. He has unlimited authority. No one can stand in his way. And he has what David points to, steadfast love. God's feelings don't change. Isn't it great that God is not moody? God is not fickle. God doesn't change his heart towards us 
when we are unresponsive and unfaithful. His faithfulness and his steadfast love carries it through. And David spotlights God's promise-making, promise-keeping nature. It settles his heart in hope and faith. He knows he can trust the Lord. And what is able to help God keep his promises is his unrivaled strength, his sovereignty, his power, his mighty hand. It's unmatched. Certainly David is thinking about the Davidic promise found in 1 Chronicles chapter 17. We don't have time to go through it, unfortunately. Maybe just turn to the next slide if you could. I'm sorry. Uh, Verse uh, 24, maybe? Sorry. Verse 8. Verse 7 and 8. There we go. Notice all of these phrases that describe what God will do. I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. I will make for you a name like the name of the great ones of the, of the earth. I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them and they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more and violent men shall waste them no more as formerly. From the time, that time I appointed judges over my people Israel and I will subdue all your enemies." I declare to you that the Lord will build you a house. When your days are fulfilled to walk among your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from him who is before you. But I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever, dependent on God's power and ability to carry it through. It's up to me. And as God will say in Ezekiel 36, I have spoken, I will do it. It depends on his power. And as God is moving the people of Israel out of Egypt and out of captivity. He says time and time again, Exodus 13, verse 3. I don't think I have these, these uh, verses on the slides, but, but listen. He says, Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. In verse 9, And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand, And as a memorial between your eyes, the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. Verse 11, when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you. Verse 16, it shall be as a mark on your hand, and as frontlets between your eyes. For by a strong hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. The strength of the Lord is your joy. Because the strength of the Lord brings hope and trust and confidence. Finally, the Lord's strength was confirmed in Christ. The Lord's strength was confirmed in Christ. Of course, while on the surface, this psalm speaks of David's thanks to God for what God has done for him. We, we come to understand that, that, that David is just this foreshadowing of this greater figure that seems to be spoken of throughout this psalm. And, and so what, what seems to be true in a, in a general and superficial way about David, it, it, it can't be truly fulfilled unless there is a greater and better figure that, that of course, David is, is pointing to, this ministry and person of Jesus Christ, this Messiah. Notice in verse 7, he shall not be moved. This word moved to slip, to totter, to stagger, to shake. Of course, David experienced his ups and downs. He was fickle in his heart. He was was here one day and gone the next. His heart was loyal one day and, and disloyal the next. Certainly, this can't be speaking of David. It must be speaking of someone better and greater. And then we find in Acts chapter 2, verse 25 and 28, Peter speaks of Christ when he says this, for David says concerning Christ, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. 
You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter is speaking of this unshakable, unmovable person of Christ. The psalm is speaking of him. At the end of verse 6 of chapter 21, notice it says, You make him glad with the joy of your presence. Again, this is something that will happen from Jesus and through his ministry. In verse 4, He asked of you, you gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. Not just the hope of an established kingdom, but the reality of true forever reigning. He asked of you, you gave it to him. It's a reality, not just a figment of his imagination, not just a theoretical uh, position. This is a reality of something that is true and has happened. He enjoys length of days forever and ever, speaking of this future messianic reign of Christ. In verse 6, for you make him most blessed forever. Here we see the quality of a life that is greater than David, this future figure, this messianic figure that's pointing to Jesus himself, this immovable, fixed ministry, this eternal life, this forever blessing. And again, Peter will speak of Jesus in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 24, when he says this, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you, with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. God's power was supreme, was ultimate. You cannot stand in his way. Christ is this future guarantee of a ministry that was promised to David and the forefathers that we enjoy through Christ. So Christ's power, what should it do for us? It should lead us to joy. Why? It should lead us to joy because of all of the things that we can experience in the Christian life happen through God's power. And I have a, man, I've got a list we can't cover. But I want to just... I'll give you the the, the fill-ins, and you have the verses, so you can look them up. But we have salvation in the gospel through God's power. Salvation in the gospel. Romans 1, 16 is familiar to you. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. And as we find from Peter in 1 Peter 1, verse 5, we are kept by the power of God, through faith, for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Salvation in the gospel. The power of God also helps to establish us in the Christian life and helps to amplify our service. The Christian life and service. In 1 Peter chapter 4, I want to focus just on verse 11. It's about halfway through. It says, whoever speaks... As one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory and dominion forever and ever. You can serve and I can serve because of the power of God and the power of God alone. We also find from the word of God, we can carry out his mission. And we can enjoy spiritual preservation because of the power of God. This mission that's found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 20, it should be very familiar because in Joshua 1, 9, he says, don't be, don't be afraid because I'm with you wherever you go. And so guess what Jesus does to the disciples? He says, all authority, meaning all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You can carry out the mission I have given to you because of my power. That should lead you to joy. But also preservation. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to the end of the chapter. I'm just going to read some of the, the red parts there. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or a sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The power of God will carry you through. Trust him. We also see the power of God through prayer, the power of God to help us overcome sin, both in Ephesians chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 2. Just read this verse from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. It says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brother, speaking of Jesus, in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. God's power can provide not only forgiveness for your sin, but the power to overcome sin in your life. And finally, the power of God that is meant to lead you to joy. We start where we, or we finish where we, let, where we started. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Paul is praying for this church. He says this, for this reason also, since the day we heard, do not cease to pray for you, to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit, uh, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power. What is accomplished? Well, patience and long-suffering with joy. So if you're struggling with joy, as I often do, God wants to supply his strength to help you overcome whatever struggles you're facing, to enjoy him and look to him in faith for the strength that he has, and to celebrate what Jesus came to accomplish through his son. Jesus came to die and to rise again, to make joy and peace with God possible as we believe in him to forgive us of sins and to carry us to heaven. This Christmas season, may God help us to look to the strength of the Lord that will lead to joy. God, we thank you for this word from the psalmist David. Thank you that David is not just interested in keeping praise contained, but he wants his praise to be experienced and enjoyed by everyone around him. Lord, may that be true of our lives. May the, the praise that we understand, we experience in our life, may it redound not only to your glory in our own lives, but in the lives of the people that are around us. May we find ways to overflow in joy and lead others into faith so they also can experience your joy. May we come to appreciate once again that our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do. May that be the bedrock that carries us through this holiday season. May it lead us to joy. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great, great day.